And I want to begin reading the Apostle Paul's word, beginning in verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. He writes, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I heard the story of a husband and wife who decided that they were going to brave the crowds and go shopping the day after Thanksgiving. Black Friday, they call it. And so they're at the shopping mall and each one decides to go uh, his, her separate way, would meet up a little bit later for something to eat. Well, the wife finished her shopping and she decided that she would, would try to find where her husband was located at that particular moment. So she called him on her cell phone and he answered. She said, where are you? She said, I'm through with my shopping. He said, well, I'll tell you. He said, you remember about 10 years ago that you and I walked into this jewelry store here in the mall and there was a beautiful diamond necklace that you really wanted, but I couldn't afford to buy it. And she started getting tears in her eyes and she said, uh, yes, darling, I remember, I remember that, that jewelry store. He said, well, if you can remember that jewelry store, you'll be able to find me. He said, I'm in the guns and ammo shop next door. <laughs> now, I have a pretty good idea. That is a woman who's had to learn contentment, right? <laughs> Don't get too excited, right? Just when you think you're about to receive a special gift, <laughs> hey, it may not happen. But the Bible encourages us to be content with such things as we have. I remember hearing George Bailey say something like this a long time ago. He said, people talk about trying to make ends meet. But he said, boy, the ends that we make meet. And that's right. Blessed people. We want to be careful that in this age of so much abundance, that we do not become guilty, as so many in the world are guilty, of being greedy. Listen to this passage in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. A better translation of the latter uh, part of that verse is he that hateth bribes shall live. Over and over again, God's word warns us about the dangers of riches. Someone has said that it might be more um, correct to refer to our nation as being one nation of greed instead of one nation under God. And maybe there's some truth to that. Throughout the history of man, greed has played in a conspicuous an evil role in man's dealings with others. In fact, a high percentage of, of heinous crimes that are committed are a result of people being greedy of gain. Now, what does greed do? Greed corrodes hearts. It spoils families' happiness. It sets people in conflict one with another. And Jesus said it could lure your heart away from him. Because in Mark 4, as he relates the parable of the soils, he says you better be careful about seed that can be choked. And what kind of seed is that? Well, there was, there was seed that would fall among the thorns. It might be choked by the thorns, the deceitfulness of riches is mentioned in that passage. Be careful because, the, because of the deceitfulness of riches, it could choke God's precious word. Now, 
We must love God supremely, and if we do, we will make sure that greed will not take place in our hearts. Now, this passage from 1 Timothy 6 is one that will help us. And I want you to notice first in the passage that God is not opposed to gain, is he? For he said godliness with contentment is great gain. God is not opposed to gain. It's just what kind of gain? For example, Paul would write Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So that is something that is profitable, to live your life for Christ and then die in him. That is something that is of a great value to you and me. Listen to these words found in 3 John 2. John writes, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. John says, I want you to do well financially. He says, I want you to prosper physically, materially, but above all, spiritually. I want your soul to prosper. When is being too rich, too rich? Well, when your soul no longer prospers, that may be when you are too rich with worldly goods. When it takes your attention off of that which is spiritual, maybe Maybe that's when you need to do some self-evaluation and say, where have I placed my priorities? Has my perspective been what it ought to be? Godliness with contentment, he says, is great gain. Now, standing opposite of this, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil or all kinds of evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Whenever I read that passage, my mind always goes back to Genesis 19. And I remember what happened to Lot because of his greed. You remember earlier that Abraham and Lot had a feud that existed between their herdsmen. And the magnanimous Abraham says, you go one way, I'll go the other. And without giving any thought to prayer, but based on nothing but greed, Lot says, I want this land that's watered. Well, Lot is thinking of himself. He's not thinking about the spiritual welfare of his family, for he pitched his tent toward that wicked city called Sodom. And we know, according to Genesis 19, what a sordid, what a sordid affair that was. And so I see this particular passage, how that some have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, and you and I have seen this exhibited in the lives of so many people who became greedy. There are biblical examples of such, and we've known people where greed has basically destroyed them. Now we understand, as we study this subject, that making money is not necessarily wrong. In fact, we need to make money. Likewise, having things is not necessarily bad. But we don't look for our contentment in money. And we don't look for our contentment in things. Because the text says every kind of evil that you can imagine at one time or another found its source in the love of money. Now oftentimes we have, we have uh, life uh, turned backwards. Our idea, at least in our society, is the more things you possess, the happier you will be. But the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, often what we give in life is more significant and adds to our happiness than what we get. For that reason, these words of Jesus are recorded in Acts 20, 35. It is better to give than to receive. That's where the blessing lies. So for just a few moments this morning, let's think about the destructiveness of greed. Inhumanity springs from one's desire to have what belongs to another. It can get nations in trouble, can it not? There will be one country who says, I want the soil of another country. And a war will be fought to take what belongs to someone else away from them. We find that that struggle can continue in relationships 
in our communities, likewise even among families, there are mothers and fathers who've not heard from their children in many, many years. But let those parents pass away and some children will all of a sudden arrive on the scene. And it may not be a pretty picture because of greed, brothers and sisters become filled with hate, hatefulness toward each other. And so greed is so very, very destructive. Even early in life, we have to let little children understand about the importance of giving and not taking. You put two children together and, and there's one toy, one's going to try to do what? Take that toy away from the other and say, it's mine. And a mother and child may enter the home of another mother and child and you want the children to play together. It might last for a little while, but what so often happens is a little child doesn't want somebody playing with his toys. And for sure, don't act like you're going to take that with you. And so very early in life, we have to begin teaching our children the perils of being greedy. In every age, the greedy, powerful, plunder and oppress those who are, are weak. There was a tyrant who died this past Friday by the name of Fidel Castro. There's you a good example of a man who plundered an island nation, left it in economic ruins, which is always the end of that particular economic system called communism, only leaving prosperity in the hands of very, very few. No telling how many people were put to death under his regime. Property stolen. People run out of the country because they feared for their own lives. That's what greed will do. Greed will cause many to commit all kinds of sins. Think about what happens sometimes in the corporate world. Look at what happens with corrupt politicians who will enter the halls of Congress with modest incomes only years later to come out having filled their pockets some way, somehow because of their sordid deals. And so we think that's bad, but let's bring it closer to home. Is it possible for a, a sales clerk sometimes to have her hand in the till and try to act as if, uh, well, I need this and nobody will really miss it. You see, you don't have to be wealthy in order to be greedy. Maybe it's a, a salesman who lies that he might make a sale. And so greediness surrounds us. In fact, when you think about the sin of greed, don't forget that it was a disciple of Jesus named Judas Iscariot who betrayed his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. That's what greed will do. Now the problem is that many are convinced that if all you have are just a few of this world's goods, then then you must not be doing something right. And some in the religious realm teach this. You know, in this particular passage, Paul says, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. You think about this. We are, we are right now bringing clothing for the people of Haiti who've lost everything. Someone, maybe a little child, is going to take the used goods that you and I have brought and be excited. It will be like something brand new to that little, little fella. It will be something unlike he's never had before, and yet it's, it's used. It's the things that we, we throw away. We've been convinced that if you have just a little, then you're not really prospering, and it could be that God doesn't favor you. That's how Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen line their pockets by convincing naive poor people, you send me your money 
and you'll be blessed. Those people who send them their money so they can live in their mansions, those same people who send in the money may not even make their regular payments each month for rent or for groceries or for heat and air. Greed. What a problem. There are people who do quite well in society because the gates of society swing open to the people who make money. Poor people can commit a crime and they may not have the funds to get the kind of representation they need in a court of law. And yet those that be rich can commit crimes and get a team of lawyers to do what? Set them free. There's always going to be this disparity, right? Because of the nature of greed. Now what will it do? Greed will, will pull your heart away from God. That's what Jesus stated in the Sermon on the Mount. Notice in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, these words of our Lord. He says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So what does God say to those who love money? You better make a decision. You better choose who it is you really love. Because a man cannot serve two masters. Not only that, greed turns neighbor against neighbor. It not only that, it not only causes uh, problems with neighbors, but causes you to have an improper perspective of life. Think about what people are willing to do just to get a deal on this date called Black Friday. I'll tell you, there was only one Black Friday that offered savings, and they were eternal savings, and that's when Jesus died on the cross. That's, that's the Black Friday we need to be concerned about. But people will run over each other, curse each other, do harm to each other. I want that. And you can't have it. That, my friends, is greed. Greed causes us to sink into debt. Oh, I understand life gets tough. I understand that sometimes you can go through a difficult period in your life. But think about how easy it is to fall into debt if we're not careful. Now, there are some things we need to, 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 to realize, and, and we need to use some wisdom so that we don't fall prey to what goes on around us. There are advertisers out there who create discontent, don't they? And they appeal to our egos. And so that advertiser says, you've got to have this. Why, you're not a good husband or a good wife if you don't purchase this for your wife for Christmas or your husband for Christmas. You're not good parents if you don't do this. The, advertise, the advertiser is, is appealing to your ego and trying to create discontent. Well, I can't be happy if I don't have that. That's what they want you to think. Now, if you find something that's advertised that appeals to you, you need to ask yourself this question. Is that really something legitimate that I need? Give yourself some time to think that through. Don't buy into what the advertiser always is selling. You give it some thought. Here's something else that's a problem. We get into trouble because we hear something like this. A limited time offer, right? Oh, that can get us. Just a limited time. I have purchased things before because it said limited time offer. Month later, go back and it still says limited time offer. <laughs> oh, don't buy into that. You've got to have this because it's just a limited time and there will be no more. And there's pressure on you to purchase the product. I've never known a time that if you weren't looking for a house, you couldn't find you one. Just give it some time. Oh, well, I've got to have that one. No, you don't. You wait a while, think it through. You'll probably get a better deal. Don't do this quickly, not when it's, not when it's money. Oh, no. Watch these phrases. 
limited time offer. Or how about this one? Buy now, pay later. Oh yeah. Did you know I can buy all this for Christmas and I won't have to make the first payment until six months from now or next year? Hey, that's a deal. No, it's not because you're not going to have any money a year from now either. <laughs> not going to help you any. Buy now, pay later. How about this one? People buy what they don't need with money they don't have to impress people they don't like. Like the neighbors. Oh, we've got good neighbors. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't want them to get ahead of me. I mean, they just bought a new car and, and look at, you know, maybe I need to go do the same thing. No, no, you don't need to do that. You need to attend a seminar of Brother Roberts over here is what you need to do and, and, and get rid of that idea. No, you see, we sink into debt many times because we've become greedy. That's why people work harder and longer than ever. Now, hard work is defended by the Bible. But in Psalm 127, you remember that, uh, that in that passage, when it comes to the home, there were those who were trying to, to burn the candle at both ends. You rise up early. You go to bed late. For what reason? So we can have more. Be wary of that. It'll take your life early. That's what it'll do. And so, sometimes we need not work as hard and just enjoy having less. There are all kinds of get-rich-quick uh, schemes out there, too, that can be a problem. You know, you buy into this and you could make some quick money. It usually doesn't work. I pity people that I come up behind them and they, they're in rags spending their money on lottery tickets, which is just another form of gambling that can lead to poverty. And then I think about this idea of just, just charge it. Well, if you don't have the money, just, just charge it. Now, these credit card companies are pretty smart. They're greedy, but they're smart. You go ahead and take that piece of plastic and you use it and you just pay the minimum payment. And they would be satisfied with you making a minimum payment for years and years and years and years. But don't you forget what the Bible teaches. And that is that the borrower is servant to the lender. They've got you right where they want you. What I'm saying, dear friends, this morning is that greed will cause you to go into debt. Greed could put you into jail and greed could put your soul in hell. That's how serious it is. Greed. Well, we want to live above the world. And we want to heed this passage behind me. Godliness with contentment is great gain. How do we live? How do we live above greed? Well, when one works and makes money and saves and gives to the Lord's cause, and if he has the means to do so, he invests properly and creatively, most likely that person is going to be blessed. But do not cross the line and become greedy. Because if you do, you're going to follow what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6. You're going to fall prey to what happens to all those who are lovers of money. For he says, which while some coveted after, They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So how do we avoid that? I want you to think this morning with me about this fundamental fact that we've got to learn, and the earlier we learn it, the better off we'll be. And that is there are a lot of things better than money. My brother Keeble even said he'd rather have friends than money, especially if his friends had money. <laughs> there are a lot of things that are better than money, like good health. You've heard about those who just about kill themselves 
The first part of life, trying to make a whole lot of money. Second part of life, they're having to spend that money, medical bills, trying to get the health back. Right? Good health, good mind, a tender heart, a clear conscience, a good family, having friends, a soul that's right with God. All of that is far more important than what money can provide. What is it Jesus said there in Mark 8? He said, what doth it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He's talking about the value of the soul. One thing we learn from that is this. Jesus just said, what if a man did that? He didn't say anybody ever had gained the whole world. Nobody ever has. There have been many who tried, but no one's ever gained the whole world. He just said, what if a man gained the whole world and lost his soul? But let's say for a moment you could gain the whole world. Here's the problem, you couldn't keep it. Because somebody's going to come along and knock you off your pedestal. Because somebody else wants it. But here's something else you have to learn. Even if you could gain the whole world and you could keep it, it wouldn't satisfy you. The things of this world were never meant to satisfy the deepest longings of the soul. You think money satisfies? Then let me give you this quote. John D. Rockefeller. Hundred years or so ago, he was the richest man, if not in America, the entire world perhaps. But America for sure. And John D. Rockefeller was asked, how much more money do you want to make? He said, just a little more. Right? You see, it doesn't satisfy. Money doesn't satisfy the things of this world do not satisfy, and we have to learn the best things in life are not things. Here's something else to consider. We need to know that money is not an end in itself. It's only a means. Maybe you and I need to ask ourselves this question. What would we do if we had greater wealth? I'd probably just be wanting more things. And before long, I'd figure out, oh, me, I thought I had all this money and make me happy, but still it's not going to provide for me all these other things that I thought I could have once I got this money. Huh. So we need to ask ourselves that question. Sometimes people ask, you know, well, oh, if I just had a whole lot more money, I, I could give more to the, to the Lord. Well, that's noble. But the question on the day of judgment will not be, what would you have done if millions had been your lot? But the Lord's going to ask, what'd you do with the dollar and a quarter in your pocket? That's what he'll ask. Oh, the idea that we have more, more money that's going to make us happy. Mm -mm. Money's just an end in itself. Only, it is not an end in itself. It's only a means. We need to know this. We cannot keep wealth forever. Because verse 7, we brought nothing into this world. And it's certain we can carry nothing out. You remember what I told you last week? Think of some of the wealthiest people just down through American history. Carnegie and Rockefeller and Astor and uh, uh, Onassis and Walton. You and I have more money right now than any of them because they're dead. I mean, they didn't take it with them. Somebody says, don't look for you all on the back of a hearse. I'm not going to take it with you. And so we need to understand that wealth cannot be kept forever. Didn't Brother, Brother Tedley, didn't he have a gift for writing music and particularly when he penned these words, earth holds no treasures but perish with using. Oh, so Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Matthew 6, 19. You know where where rust and moth cannot corrupt, where thieves cannot break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You think you can take it with you? Two good examples I can think about in the Bible. One's a foolish farmer in Luke 12. The other is a foolish rich man in Luke 16. Neither of them took it with them. The question even is asked, after you're gone, then who's to those become a group of greedy children, right? That's right. For that reason, some people have said, I'm outspending my children's inheritance. Okay, I understand that. But greediness. I'll tell you something else greed will not do. 
Or money will not do. Money will not buy you heaven. See? Money will not buy you heaven. So it is that a man may stand before the Lord in judgment one day and he, uh, he may hear that his entire family enters into glory. Wife, children, grandchildren. And then he hears the sentence that he's to depart. Heaven will not be his home. Oh, but Lord, you need to understand now, while it's true that I was not a faithful member of the church, I never stood in the way of my family being faithful members of the church. And not only that, hey, listen, that check my wife put, that was from my account. <laughs> that going to impress the Lord? Hmm. Mean absolutely nothing. You see, what we do with what we have during this time here on earth, that's important. But here's what we need to remember. Everything we have belongs to the Lord already. The earth is the Lord's. Psalm 24, 1. The fullness therein. It all belongs to him. Whatever we have is given to us in a trust. And so verse 17 of 1 Timothy 6. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So I'll travel through life doing the best I can to manage or to be a good steward of what God has given me. But I dare not push my, put my trust in uncertain riches that can gather wings and fly away. My trust, your trust, better be in the Lord. You see, people who are greedy for gain have this problem. They don't trust God. Now, think about this this morning. If we've come to Christ and we've been saved from our past sins, we trust him with our souls, right? That's the greatest possession we have. So if we trust God with our souls, shouldn't we trust every area of our lives to him? And therefore, none of us should be saying, how are we going to get by? Oh, no. We'll do what we're supposed to do. But in God, we put our trust. He'll take care of us. Oh, I don't want to be greedy for gain. I want to trust in God. And let him take care of me, don't you? And when we do that, he receives the glory, the honor for taking care of us all these years. This morning, there is something that is far more important than you getting money. And what is far more important than you getting money is gaining salvation. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Can you be content? Yes. But those who are content are those who are godly. Godliness, godlike, with contentment. Content with what you have is great gain. And so the only way you can be godly is to come to Christ. Let him forgive your sins. And then he gives you this noble goal the rest of your life, you can seek to be more and more and more like him. In him, you'll learn to tr trust in the living God. In him, you'll learn to overcome greed. In him, you will truly learn how to live. You will. And so this morning, if you need to respond to him as he is so designated in his word, through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, we stand ready to help you. Or if you're here this morning in need of restoration, we'll be glad to assist you to be restored. If only you'll come, as together we stand and sing.